My name is Lisa Whitmer. I'm the Director of Adult Education at NYBG. And you are here to hear about Harriet Tubman, who is the ultimate outdoors woman, among many other things. Before I introduce our program, I have just a little bit of Zoom-related housekeeping. Um, we do have closed captioning available, so if you would like to use it, uh, please click on the live transcript or CC button at the bottom of your screen. We will be taking questions at the end of the talk, uh, and we encourage you to put them in the Q&A as soon as they come to you. Uh, you will not interrupt the program, and that way we'll have a rich group of questions for our speaker that I will come back onto the screen to moderate at the end. So if you would like to put a question, you'll notice that at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button, and you can go ahead and press on that button and type your question in there. So as a former high school history teacher, I am over the moon about this morning's talk about Harriet Tubman and particularly thrilled to welcome Angela Crenshaw to NYBG. When I read about Angela in an Audubon article about Harriet Tubman's naturalist skills, her passion for history fairly leapt off the page. So as we listen to Angela this morning and learn more about the heroic deeds of Harriet Tubman, I believe it is very important, particularly in light of the recent events across the nation in the past couple of weeks and years, for each of us to consider how this history continues to impact our present and how each of us as individuals has the power to choose compassion and love in every moment of our lives. Angela Crenshaw has worked for the Maryland Department of Natural Resources for almost 15 years. She started removing abandoned boats and debris, and over the years, she rose to become a park ranger. By 2017, she was assistant manager of the Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad State Park. Currently, she works at Gunpowder Falls State Park <clears throat> as an interpreter of difficult histories. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm going to say that one more time because it's important. Currently, she works at Gunpowder Falls State Park as an interpreter of difficult histories for the Maryland Park Service to ensure that the histories presented in Maryland's parks tell the whole story, the pain and the triumph of this, our American history. So with that, I warmly, warmly welcome and turn it over to Ranger Angela Crenshaw. Angela. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much, Lisa, for that lovely introduction. Uh, hello, once again, my name is Ranger Angela Crenshaw, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about Harriet Tubman's life and legacy. Harriet Tubman lived to be 91 years old. Today, I'll be sharing information about her formative years spent in South Dorchester County on Maryland's Eastern Shore. It was here that she lived, toiled, loved, and learned the skills that made her into a world-famous Underground Railroad conductor and the ultimate outdoors woman. All the landscape images you see will be from South Dorchester County on the lands that shaped Ms. Harriet Tubman. After my presentation, I'll do my best to answer all of your questions. Now, let's start at the beginning. In late February or early March of 18, 22, Harriet Tubman was born in the town of Tobacco Stick, which is now known as Madison in Dorchester County on Maryland's Eastern Shore. Her parents, Ben and Britt Ross, gave her the name Araminta. She went by Minty for short. As you can see, Southern Dorchester County is a place of absolutely beautiful, uh, of absolutely great beauty and amazing splendor. However, the horrors of American slavery were a daily struggle. Enslaved people had no rights under the law and were treated as property the same as livestock. Young Araminta was born into this system of bondage and rented out to cruel and negligent temporary masters. From a young age, she was separated from her family and required to do domestic labor such as cleaning, caring for small children, and checking muskrat traps during the dead of winter. With regards to American slavery, she said, slavery is the next thing to hell. If a person would send another to bondage, he would send them to hell if he could. Young Minty's earliest memory was that of being a child. She said, the first thing I remember was lying in the cradle. 
I remember laying in there when the young ladies in the big house where my mother worked would come down and catch me up in the air before I could walk. At about the age of five, she was left in charge of caring for her younger brothers while her mother worked in the big house. She recalls the baby began to worry or cry. So she cut a piece of pork and put it in the child's mouth and the child stopped crying. When her mother came home, she noticed the piece of pork hanging out the child's mouth and thought young Minty had killed the baby. But instead she had succeeded in soothing her upset younger brother. I like to start with that story because it shows that young Minty can think on her feet from a very young age and it also shows her love and her compassion. Minty's, young, Minty's owner attempted to sell her younger brother Moses. Sensing danger was around, her mother Rit took the boy and hid him in the surrounding swamp. As you can see from these pictures, the swamp lands around the Blackwater River are dense and unforgiving. To this day, they remain very hostile and difficult to traverse. With the help of her mother and others in the community, Rit hid the boy until the interested buyer had left town. This shows that she had the skills to keep a child alive and sheltered and fed in a very hospital, inhospitable and treacherous landscape. She also took a substantial risk to find her master. When her owner approached her home with the buyer, they called him a Georgia man at the time, she looked at her, him firmly and said, you are here about my son, but the first man that comes into my house, I'll crack his skull open. Ritz boldness and knowledge of outdoor survival, along with assistance from her community, saved the young boy's life and no doubt was very influential on young Minty. Harriet recalls keeping her mother keeping young Moses hidden in the swamp for about a month. If you visit Dorchester County today, Greenbrier and gum swamps are still very inhospitable and difficult places to traverse. While just a child, young Minty was rented out to the Cook family. She was tasked with checking their muskrat traps. The marshy wetlands of Dorchester County were the ideal location for, for muskrats, which are semi-aquatic critters that burrow into the soil and dine on aquatic vegetation. She was required to set these traps on the banks of streams where they build their domed houses. This would have been very, very difficult for a young child. As you can see in the statue there, young Minty's foot is in the soil and then it sinks deeply. I can attest to that. If you step out of a canoe or a kayak or from the firm land onto the ground, you will sink in the thick, dark mud and it will hold you down. She had to traverse this harsh, swampy, and unfriendly landscape in the dead of winter when the muskrat pelts are at their thickest and their finest. Muskrats are also, muskrats are also known to be foul-tempered creatures and very difficult subjects. Young Harriet came down with the measles while doing this job and was forced to traipse through the landscape anyway. Eventually, her mother convinced her owners to allow her to rest and recover. When she was an adolescent, she received a horrific head injury at the Bucktown Village store, which nearly killed her. She was tasked with going with the plantation cook to the Bucktown Village store uh, where they needed to purchase some items. When she got there, she said her hair was puffy and stood out like a bushel basket. So she covered it with a shawl. She thinks that shawl saved her life. There was a runaway in the store that day and a slave catcher looked right at Harriet and said, grab that slave. And Harriet said, no. So the uh, slave catcher picked up a two pound weight and threw it, meaning to hit Harriet instead, excuse me, meaning to hit the runaway. Instead, he hit Harriet square above her eye. The last thing she remembers was him picking up the weight. She, not, she was knocked out completely and taken next door where she was left to rest on a loom chair. She received no medical care and she said you could take three fingers and stick them into the first knuckle into her wound. The next day she was tasked with getting back to work. She said she couldn't because she was bleeding and sweating so much into her eyes. So her owner took her back and uh, allowed her mother to take care of her. Young Minty was then resting and trying to recuperate under the care of her mother and people were coming to buy her and they would poke her, they would touch her back, they would check her legs to see if she was still strong and they would check her teeth. And eventually when she couldn't be sold, she said her skin was rotting off of her body. Her owner looked at her and said, she's not worth a sixpence. Now this was horrible for her physically, but it was amazing for her spiritually. And we also think it gave her something called temporal lobe epilepsy. She suffered the repercussions of this for the rest of her life, but we think it also gave her her fearlessness. Tubman grew up and endured these frequent separations from her family and physical injuries that would plague her for the rest of her life. 
preferring a relative freedom of being outside to the to domestic work, which is done under the watchful eye of petty and tyrannical mistresses, Tubman began to work in the timber fields with her father, Ben Ross, who was a respected timber foreman. She would have been one, if not the only woman working in the timber fields at the time, cutting timber, hauling wood, driving oxen, and as she said, doing all the work of a man. She lifted huge barrels loaded with goods bound for market and pulled heavy laden boats through the canal system like an ox. She said she could cut half a cord of wood a day. She hauled logs and reportedly was the marvel of her master who would often exhibit her feats of strength to his friends. This is quite substantial considering there was no heavy machinery and all of this backbreaking labor was done by hand. Working in these timber fields required both free and enslaved labor to have very specialized skills and an intimate knowledge of the land and the surrounding waterways. Timber work was arduous and hazardous and the vast marshes provided ample stagnant water for mosquitoes and other irritating and often dangerous insects. The work of dragging logs was backbreaking. It was here that she learned the skills necessary to become a successful conductor on the Underground Railroad. Skills such as foraging for food, traversing harsh landscapes, being comfortable outdoors, and physical and mental strength. Tubman was very proud of her physical strength and her knowledge of the outdoors, particularly, work, particularly in these work assignments traditionally assigned to men. She claimed to have a great love of physical activity and noted that the amount extracted of a woman of her time was $50 to $60, and that of a man was 100 to 160, implying that her labor was worth that of what a man could earn for himself or his master. The image you're seeing is by Mark Priest, and it shows Stewart's Canal being built. The canal was hand dug by crews of both free and enslaved Africans and out of the marshland from uh, Parsons Creek to the head of the Blackwater River. Such canals as this one were used to supplement the many natural creeks and streams throughout the county and to increase access to timber fields in the interior and to take the products to small shipyards and eventually to, and eventually to larger ports like Baltimore. With canals, the difficult task of hauling white oak, pine, and walnut was somewhat alleviated as these products could be floated to market. Free black workers, excuse me, free black sailors known as black jacks provided information about safe houses and routes on the Underground Railroad. There were also a network of communication between ports and these tight knit communities. They also taught Harriet Tubman how to read the stars, which was a skill that they needed for work, but that she would eventually use to free herself and her people. If you visit Maryland's Dorchester County now, Stewart's Canal still exists, little change from its original configuration. This map shows Dorchester County, Maryland and its districts and its cities. Tubman was born in Tobacco Stick. If you can see my pointer, there it is right there. It's now known as the town of Madison. She was moved to Bucktown, which is over here when she was a child. And here is Stewart's Canal. It empties into the Little Blackwater River right down there and it connects to the Blackwater River. As you can see, it's quite straight and nature doesn't really do straight. That's how you know it was hand built and handmade. I also wanna point out the waterfront towns of Wolford and Church Creek. It was in these ports where the valuable timber was taken to be processed into shingles, staves, board, boards and wood and pulp for shipbuilding. It was in these waterfront towns where Tubman would have met the Black Jacks and it's between these towns and areas where Tubman would have had to traverse to visit family and friends and also to go to church. Of her early years, young Harriet said, I grew up like a neglected weed, ignorant of liberty and having no experience of it. This was because it was illegal to teach African-Americans to read and write or give them any education before the Civil War. So everything that Harriet Tubman learned about outdoor survival, she learned from her mother and her father and from the surrounding communities that lived on the Eastern shore of Maryland and supported her during this very difficult time. The geography of Dorchester County with its wide tracts of timber, swamps, tidal marshes, creeks and inlets provided cover for freedom seekers and eventually Tubman and her charges. Young Mincy and her brothers, Ben and Harry attempted to run away but disagreed on the route, so they turned back. This is the runaway no notice from that attempt that shows the reward for $100 for each of them upon arrival if taken out of state. Runaways were to be returned to Eliza Brodus, 
who lives near Bucktown in Dorchester County, Maryland. It says that Minty is age 27 years of age, is chestnut color and fine looking and about five feet tall, just like your favorite park ranger. However, Tubman's owner continued to live well beyond his means and was in financial trouble. During that time of American slavery, Tubman and other enslaved people were property and considered and could be sold at any time. Tubman feared she'd be sold just like her sisters, Mariah, Reddy, Lina, and Soph, who were sold south and never to be seen again. Tubman did not want that fate for herself. In September of 1849, Harriet Tubman took her liberty. She ran away from bondage at Poplar Neck in Caroline County, this time on her own. Traveling mostly at night and following the North Star, Tubman made her way north. She used her connections on the Underground Railroad for shelter and forged for food. She finally made it to freedom in Philadelphia. Of oh, freedom, she said, when I found I had crossed that line, I looked at my hands to see if I was the same person. There was such a glory over everything. The sun came like gold through the trees and over the fields, and I felt like I was in heaven. Whenever anyone asks me what freedom is, I share this quote with them. Freedom was wonderful, but it was nothing without her family. She said, I was a stranger in a strange land. And my home, after all, was down in Maryland because my father, my mother, my brothers and sisters and friends were all down there. Tubman found refuge in Philadelphia where there's a strong and supportive community. And she did domestic work to earn money for her journeys of mercy. But what is freedom without those you love? Using the Underground Railroad, Harry Tubman returned to the Eastern shore of Maryland to rescue 70 family and friends and people she could not live without. She said, but I was free and they should be free. I would make a home in the North and I would bring them there, God helping me. This image is by Jacob Lawrence and it shows Tubman pointing at the North Star and guiding her charges through the wilderness to freedom in the North. In spite of its name, the Underground Railroad had no trains, no tracks and no cabooses. It was a resistance movement against slavery through escape and flight. Free and enslaved African-Americans, as well as white supporters, provided food, shelter, transportation, money, and directions. Also known as the Liberty Lines, the Underground Railroad used railroad vernacular as a coded language for those individuals involved in the migration of African-Americans to freedom. Those who coordinated escapes were known as agents, guides were known as conductors, and established stops were known as stations. Those who ran the stations were known as station masters. Tubman not only emancipated family and friends, but she provided directions and instructions to others who made the journey on their own. She said, I was the conductor of the Underground Railroad for eight years. I can say what most conductors cannot say. I never ran my train off the track and I never lost a passenger. Harry preferred to travel during the winter when the nights were long and the sky was clear and the ground was frozen solid. She and her party of freedom seekers would travel at night and rest during the day. Tubman said she could tell time by the stars and find her way by natural signs as well as any hunter. She used the outdoor survival skills that she learned in Dorchester County to conduct herself and others to freedom and away from bondage. Harriet also used the call of an owl to alert freedom seekers if it was dangerous or safe to come out while they were hiding and to continue their journey. It would have been the barred owl, or as it's also called the hoot owl. They make a sound that sounds like, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? The barred owl and its call is ubiquitous on Maryland's Eastern shore. And it would not have stood out as odd to hear that call at night. She also inspired a piece by Robert Hayden called Runnigate Runnigate. And this is the one that Lisa was mentioning. When I lived on the shore, I would hear the barred owl at night and I committed this uh, poem to memory. Hoot owl calling in the ghosted air, five times calling to the haunts in the air, shadow of a face in the scary leaves, shadow of a voice in the talking leaves. Hayden also referred to Tubman as a woman of the earth, and I couldn't agree more. She used her knowledge of nature and the landscape to improve the lives of her and her family and friends. Tubman's final journey as a conductor on the Underground Railroad was in the winter of 1860. She returned to the Eastern shore of Maryland to emancipate her sister, Rachel, and her children, Ben and Angerine. But upon arrival, Tubman was heartbro heartbroken to learn that Rachel had passed away and she was unable to get her niece and nephew for want of $30. She spent a night waiting hopefully for her family members. 
However, this was during a blinding snowstorm and she protected herself behind a tree as well as she could, but leaving herself exposed to the fury of the storm and knowing that if she waited any longer, slave patrols and slave catchers monitored the countryside and Tubman knew any time spent waiting in place increased her risk of being lost. She knew she couldn't wait any longer. So instead of waiting, wasting a trip, she took the Enos family, which was Stephen and Maria and their three children, as well as two others. Tubman guided the family uh, to an underground railroad station master's home. However, when she knocked on the door, she was distressed to find that her friend was obliged to leave for harboring fugitives. Finding herself caught off guard, Tubman hurried the runaways to the outskirts of town where they found a swamp. They waded to the middle of the swamp and stayed on an island until it was safe. The tall grass offered the ideal camouflage until they could move on. They waded to an island and carried the baby in a basket. They were hotly pursued but found deliverance in the form of a Quaker man and his wagon. They continued on their journey and hid in the woods that Tubman knew so well. She had to secret them in the woods once again as she foraged for food to look to, for to feed her charges and to keep them safe. Some one point when she came back uh, to the swamp, they had traveled deeper inside. So she used bird calls and songs to let them know that it was okay to travel towards her and continue their journey. Their journey. They eventually made their way to Wilmington, Delaware and then to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania where they were given food, clothing and money. They were no doubt appreciative of Tubman and her knowledge of the outdoors for their survival on this very treacherous journey. But Tubman's personal war against American slavery did not end with her journeys of mercy on the Underground Railroad. During the Civil War, she was a nurse, a scout, and a spy by night. The coastal landscape of South Carolina looks very similar to that of South Dorchester County. They are both tidal marshes with creeks and streams and canals and lowland forests. Tubman used her knowledge of how to travel in this landscape during her time as a spy for the Union Army. On June 1st, 1863, Harriet Tubman became the first woman to lead and execute an armed raid on the, during the Civil War. She joined Colonel James Montgomery and 300 troops from the 2nd South Carolina and a few from the 3rd Rhode Island Battalion as they chugged about 20 miles up the Cumby River in South Carolina. They started at Port Royal, and they took the John Adams, the Harriet Weed, and the Sentinel, which were three steam-powered gunships. The purpose of the raid was to disturb the Confederate supply, and that they did. They opened sluice gates and flooded rice fields, ruining that season's crops. And they burned down plantations, homes, and confiscated corn, cotton, and rice. They also destroyed the pontoon bridge at the Cumbie River Ferry, which was a key transportation route. On June 2nd, Colonel James Montgomery ordered the steamships to sound their whistles. This was the signal to enslaved people to run towards the boat for their freedom. Some were reluctant, but Tubman noted that they soon realized that Lincoln's gunboats had come to set them free. Men, women, and children grabbed what they could and headed for the boats with overseers and plantation masters trying their best in vain to stop them. In all, about 730 people were emancipated during this raid, and there were no uh, wounds or casualties on the Union side. This was also a boon for Colonel James Montgomery as 100 to 180 men signed up for his regiment. My favorite aspect of this event was the fact that Tubman stayed behind to help those that she had emancipated, these newly free people. She understood the need for assistance and support when transitioning from being enslaved to a free person. She said, most of them coming from the mainland were destitute, almost naked, and I'm trying to find places for those able to work and provide for them as best as I can while at the same time they learn to respect themselves by earning a living. At the park, guests were always curious about the friendship between Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass. Of Miss Tubman, Douglass wrote, the midnight sky and the silent stars have been the witnesses of your devotion to freedom and heroism. Meaning that what, Tub what Douglass did to fight for freedom was done during the day and in the light. And what Harriet Tubman did was under the cover of darkness because she herself was a runaway. It should be noted that both of these uh, now famous abolitionists were born on Maryland's Eastern shore about a county apart and they worked tirelessly to end American slavery. Tubman eventually moved to Auburn, New York where she adopted a daughter named Gertie and she married her second husband, Nelson Davis. Tubman took in and cared for anyone who was in need. 
She attended conferences and meetings in New York, New York and Massachusetts and fought for women's right to vote. She was also an active member in the AME Zion Church of Auburn and collected clothes for destitute children and she supported her community. She also had a garden and a brick building business. She was well known about around Auburn and is even recorded as, as having made a remedy for our colicky babies in the neighborhood from items in her garden and the surrounding woods. In 1896, she purchased a five acre lot with the goal of achieving her dream to open and care for sick and aged African Americans. Within months, she had incorporated the Harriet Tubman home. Tubman struggled to raise money to keep her dream alive but she continued boarding people at her home, including young children. In 1908, the Harriet Tubman Home for Aged and Indigent Negroes officially opened. She had fulfilled her lifelong dream. However, her health began to decline at that point and she used a wheelchair for mobility. And then she was eventually confined to her bed. In her late eighties, Harriet Tubman entered the Harriet Tubman Home that she had fought so hard to open. This is where the picture above was taken. It's one of the last known images of her. On March 10th, 1913, Harriet Tubman passed away of pneumonia at the age of 91. Before she slipped into a coma, she said, I go away to prepare a place for you, that where I am, you may also be. She is buried in Fort Hill Cemetery in Auburn, New York, next to her brother. I find it incredible that Tubman began acquiring her expertise as a child while doing what she had to just to survive. We don't really think about what knowledge and skills she would have had in order to accomplish the impossible. If you'd like to take your experience further, I suggest reading this book called Bound for the Promised Land. It's by Dr. Kate Clifford Larson. She's the park's historical consultant and all the exhibits are based on her efforts and her research about Harriet Tubman's life. I wanna take a moment to thank New York Botanical Garden for inviting me here to talk Tubman today. It's an honor and a privilege to be able to share her life with you all. I hope you all feel, to, feel inspired by her life spent tirelessly fighting for freedom and you have an understanding of how her formative years spent on Maryland's Eastern shore shaped her into both the heroine of freedom and the ultimate outdoors woman. Once again, thank you. Hi, Angela. Thank you so much for your talk. You're very welcome. Um, we do have a couple of questions for you here. Um, uh, Virginia Lamb says, thank you. Um, this is amazing. Uh, how many trips was Harriet Tubman estimated to have made? 13 in total. And that's a lot consider considering how difficult it is to move yourself and a group of people over 100 miles. Yeah. Wow. Yep. Uh, and the fact that she never lost a person. No, never. She she did 13 trips and was able to make it through um, keeping everybody safe. And I think it's also worth noting again that she didn't just bring people to freedom, but she helped people find jobs. She helped people find places. She helped in that transition, which is actually something that I, I have never heard. So thank you for that uh, bit, of, bit of information. Sure. Um, okay, so um, I, there's a question from Lee. Um, Lee says she's a, a licensed New York City tour guide and regularly shows um, people the Harriet Tubman statue in Harlem. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, Angela. I think this question has to do with that particular statue. So we'll see how we, we do here. Okay. Um, but in her bronze skirt, among many images that elaborate her story is something round, with holes in it. Uh, visitors frequently ask what that is. Lee's best guess is that it's a honeycomb, um, something that perhaps fleeing people might use in the woods for nourishment. Um, do you think that makes sense? I am looking at my phone so I can look okay. up the statue and have a general idea of what it looks like. Uh, I thought you were going somewhere else with that question and you were gonna ask if she carried a shotgun. Uh, a lot of the images show her carrying a shotgun, but she actually carried a small pistol that was not only to keep people safe in case there were dogs or slave catchers, but uh, also to encourage people to keep moving if it was necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, she never had to shoot it, but she did have to point it at someone and let them know that slaves tell no tales. Mm. Let's see, I'm looking at it now, and is she holding it in her hand? I think it's on her skirt. On her skirt. Let me see if. 
Is that her bag? It's tough with these images. Mm -hmm. I just see her holding a bag as she's heading forward. And I like the movement of it, to tell you the truth. Uh, Great. So I couldn't answer that more fully. I'm not familiar with it, but it looks like a beautiful monument to Miss Tubman. And someone put flowers in her hand. No. Yeah. Um, okay, so of the 13 trips that she made, um, how, do, do we know how many people she freed? Uh, helped about 70. 70 yep. people, yep. wow. And that's all family and friends, including the Enos family at the far end. And she also emancipated her elderly parents. And that was one of the journeys she actually did in the spring, which would have been very difficult because the trees are full, with, full of leaves, so you could hardly see the stars. And it's also pretty damp and moist and it's very atmospheric on the Eastern shore. So when I lived there, I could rarely see the stars in the summer and the spring, but they were very, very clear in the fall and the winter. Is that when she did most of her trips was fall and winter then? Yes, yes, ma'am. Because the and nights were the longest so they could travel longer and the, the ground was frozen, which was good and bad. But I can tell you, if you step in the wrong place, you will sink. Mm -hmm. um, and also something a lot of folks don't think of, if you come into a town like Philadelphia and you're covered in mud knee deep or you're soaking wet, you've clearly been doing something you have no business doing. So your clothes can get you caught as well. Mm -hmm. And most enslaved people were severely underdressed. Uh, they did not like I'm wearing steel toed boots right now in my uniform and thick reinforced pants. They did not have those options at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Um, do we know what she grew in her garden? That's a very good question. Uh, I think it was things she could eat and consume and things she could sell. I think I've seen potatoes, tomatoes, things like that. Um, but there was nothing listed um, that I could point you towards. Mm -hmm. And similar question around the specific plants that she foraged, um, either for sustenance or for medicine on her, her journeys. Um, do we know much about that? Uh, I know there's some plants on the eastern shore that have lovely tubers down at the bottom, mm -hmm. uh, which are like potatoes. Uh, you'd have to forage a good amount of them, but it was something. It was definitely sustenance. And also the neighboring farmlands, if there was something growing, she could take those items as well to feed her charges. Uh, but anything that was growing and edible, we also have a lot of uh, different kind of funguses on the shore. Um, and uh, right before COVID started, I was attempting to get an outdoor survivalist down to the park to walk around and show people what they could and couldn't eat, but that was clearly wiped out. Um, mm -hmm. That is something I'd like to do uh, once we're able to do outdoor programs again. Mm -hmm. That sounds amazing. I feel mm -hmm. like a, a, bo a botanical guide um, would, be, would be really, I think um, people would love it. Mm -hmm, definitely. Um, okay, so you mentioned, K Kale asks, uh, well, first dates, you mentioned that she learned a lot of her star knowledge from the Black Jacks or the mm -hmm. Free Black Sailors. Mm -hmm. Do you have any suggestions for learning more about the astronomies of Black Freedom? Mm, the astronomies of Black Freedom. Oh, I'm inspired. Uh, there's a few books about Black Jacks. Some of them are very, very specific. Um, the gentleman's main gentleman's name is Oluwadu. And he is, he actually starts from the beginning. He was kidnapped from Africa and has very vivid memories of that and the war and being thrown into a prison and taken onto a boat and then taken to America and what he had to learn to survive. Um, let's see, Frederick Douglass was also, uh, when he was trying to get to his freedom, he also had, he, got, he had training in uh, shipbuilding. I believe he was a caulker. So he talks a little bit about that. I'd recommend his second book and his first book. He was very quiet. He thought people sharing about the Underground Railroad was the worst idea in the history of man because then it made it what he called above ground. Mm -hmm. But in his second book, he kind of changed his mind and started talking about more of his contacts. Um, let's see, Kate's book mentions of information about it. I'm trying to think of the other one. There's one book called Blackjacks, but it's very, very general. Um, and I tend to focus on um, Maryland and the Eastern Shore. This one talks a little bit more about uh, South Carolina and Boston and New York as well. But depending on where you are, that might be the be best option for you. Mm -hmm. um, the name, let me look up the author, but the book is, is called Black Jacks. One second. Love having a phone. <laughs> Let's see. And then I'll look up how to spell Ol Oluwatu too. Because his name is not very intuitive. I'll have to look that up and write it down. I'll tell you when I see it. 
Okay, that sounds great. Yep. Um, Karen Washington asks, where is the museum? Um, what city um, that you, the Harriet Tubman Museum? It's in Church Creek. So it, you can see it from that map that I pointed out. Uh, it's about 14 miles south of Cambridge on Maryland's Eastern shore. Uh, currently the visitor center is open from Thursday to Sunday, I believe, but you might wanna double check that from I believe 10 to four. Uh, they have time in the middle to close and they try to ask you to have reservations so that they can make sure that the times are staggered. Mm -hmm. And the book Black Jacks is by W. Jeffrey Bolster. And I'm gonna see if I can spell Oluwadu's name well enough to look it up. Mm -hmm. Oh, here it is. O-L-U-A-D-A-H space E-Q-U-I-A-N-O. Hopefully Great. that helps. That one's very detailed and it will put you in a place, I can guarantee it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so Lex asks, Ranger Angela, can you share about how Harriet and learning about her has shaped your own relationship with the land? Oh, very good question. Uh, so when I took the job down there, I had to move. Um, about four hours south of where I was living, five hours south, and I didn't have cable or the internet, so I would just sit on my porch with my dog and read a lot of books, and the only thing I really had to do in my mind was to watch the sunset and learn, and mm -hmm. then the more I learned about Tubman, I realized that the sunset I was watching is setting on, was setting on where she was born. It was about five miles as the crow flew, so it was very, very close. Uh, so I started hiking at night with my dog. And like I said, that's how I found out you can't really see the stars uh, when the leaves are full, when the leaves are full. It's really, really difficult because I, you sink. I've fallen quite a few times. And of course you land on briars and other things you don't want to land on. Mm -hmm. So that's how I found out that walking during the winter or the fall was much, much easier. You could see the moon through, you could see the stars. Uh, it was much clearer. You could see the undergrowth a little bit. Um, and it also makes me, it kind of made me want to connect people to the outdoors. Um, the visitor center is actually the smallest state park in Maryland. It's only 17 acres. So once you get there and you see the visitor center, there's a three quarter mile walking trail, but that's really about it. So that made me want to show people more of the landscape and lead guided hikes and explain the importance of this landscape, because the more you learn about it, it those people's lives were intertwined. They did not have a choice. It was nothing special uh, that she could read the stars or that she could cut down trees or forage for food. That's just the way she had to live. Mm -hmm. um, it also made me want to be much closer to my family, which is why I transferred to gunpowder to be closer to my nieces and my brother and my parents, uh, especially during what's been going on. I just wanted to be close to my family and friends, but it's made me, I think, closer to the landscape um, as you can see, I have to pile my hair up uh, to be in uniform. It can't touch my collar. I'm much more accepting of bugs and critters being close to me. It's just, it doesn't phase me quite as much. Now it'd be different if there was a tarantula in my hair. We'd have a problem. But most things that are, you know, local to Dorchester County, I can tolerate. I am allergic to biting flies, which a lot of people are, which was a pain down there. Uh, it also made me want to... Uh, just learn more about how runaways use the landscape. And before this call started, I was uh, telling Lisa about uh, how we're trying to connect other Maryland state parks to uh, other established runaways and how um, my favorite Maryland state park is Rocky Gap. And I was reading one escape from Old Town that went up Evitts Creek, which Rocky Gap uh, preserves. And you know it's Evitts Creek when they're talking about it. So just the importance of the landscape and how runaways use the landscape to their advantage uh, was really, really very important to me. And it allowed me to make a stronger connection to nature and the outdoors. Angela, I'm so glad you brought that up. Will you, um, just because the image, when you mentioned it before the call, um, it's just, you painted such a picture of the topography. Um, do you mind um, explaining that for the audience again, how the, the question I had asked was how she, Angela was saying that she's she's really trying to locate specific runaway slave um, narratives in the Maryland parks. And she said she had gotten pretty close in one particular area. And I had asked her, how were those geographies cited um, in those letters or in the journals? Or I'm not even sure what kind of primary sources you're using. Um, and so with Gunpowder Falls, will you explain a little bit about the topography that makes you know that that's the place? Sure. So 
uh, out at Rocky Gap, they preserve, preserve Wills Creek, Evitz Creek. Uh, their main <clears throat> lake is Lake Habib, uh, but it's a huge side of a mountain and this amazing topography. And uh, there's an account of some runaways running up a gorge and hiding behind these rocks and the rocks that jut out of uh, Allegheny County in Western Maryland are very, they have just right angles to them. They're very straight, they're very narrow. They jut down and up and all around. And so they are the perfect place to hide behind, to hide under for shelter. I've actually done that before it started raining and it scurried under a, um, a stone. Clearly my hair wasn't piled up, but it, it was enough space for me to sit under there and have protection from the rain. Um, and I just knew it was Evitz Creek when I was reading about it. And then they mentioned where they started, which was Old Town and then the Northern Town. And I was like, there's no other towns between Old Town and I forget the one in Pennsylvania that they got to, but it had to have been Evitz Creek. Uh, so we're trying to connect uh, the landscapes, at least I'm trying to connect the landscapes to the escapes because, <clears throat> excuse me, these Maryland state parks were not in existence, of course, in the 1800s when enslaved people were running away and seeking their freedom, but the landscape was still there and also about the same. Um, so that's where we're trying to connect uh, Maryland state parks to these landscapes to make them National Park Service Network to Freedom sites where people can go and experience what the landscape would have looked like, what runaways would have seen, uh, any help they would have gotten from the topography and neighboring people, folks on the Underground Railroad and Quakers, um, which were the main helpers in Maryland. And uh, Western Maryland is also very, very narrow. So you could be West, West Virginia here, across the Potomac, be in Maryland. And a few miles later, you're up in Pennsylvania, across the Mason-Dixon line, where you were technically free before 1850, and there were more sympathizers up there. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that connection. And just the importance, I think, of the landscape is not something that folks consider. Mm -hmm. um, especially when you're in, I don't know, Washington and D Washington DC and Baltimore where the landscape has been changed significantly as opposed to if you're on the Eastern shore of Maryland or out in Western Maryland where that topography is all about the same. Mm -hmm. Great. story boring, that's my answer. No, I, <laughs> I love the details. Um, so Monique uh, has a very uh, articulate thank you for you that I just wanna read. Um, thank you so much, Ranger Crenshaw. What a wonderful presentation you illustrated dynamic, powerful elements of Harriet Tubman's life to reinforce her agency. I noted your choices in language were affirming, affirming and rehumanizing, such yeah. as enslaved people, and mm -hmm. Harriet took her liberty. Always. And your your interaction with the land, with woman of the earth. So thank you again, an inspiring um, hour. And thank you for noticing. I try to use, uh, at the park, we would model good behavior. So our guests would say, slave, slave this. We'd say, well, enslaved people did this and enslaved people did that. And I always try to highlight the fact that they did that themselves. That was their agency, that was their choice. That was the, like inside of Tubman, her compassion was clearly in her heart from the very beginning and it just shined in everything mm. that she did. And I thought that was so important. Mm. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Um, we have a couple questions about her name. Um, yeah. She changed her name, why, when? So I had to leave out a lot. I can clearly talk Tubman all day and I, <laughs> I try to limit it because there's always a ton of questions which are lovely. Uh, but in her twenties, she married, uh, so she was born Araminta Ross. Araminta is the name her parents gave her most likely after a valued aunt. Um, there were, there's a lot of name reuse which is still going on in a lot of African-American families. I know my middle name is Francis. There's a Francis in every generation. My niece's nickname is Bubby. There's a Bubby in every generation. So reusing names isn't, isn't really anything new. And of course she took Ross, which were her parents' uh, last name. Then in her twenties, she married John Tubman, who was a free man. And she of course took his last name Tubman and changed her name to Harriet. And we think that was in dedication to her mother. Her mother's name was uh, Harriet Ross, but she went by Rit, which is why I refer to her as Rit. And also two Harriets and one Harriet presentation is too much. So <laughs> she took Harriet in honor of her mother. So that's when she became Harriet Tubman. Uh, if you go up to New York, such as Auburn, uh, she, her name is Harriet Tubman Davis or Harriet Davis. And that's because she married Nelson Davis later in life. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Um, can you speak to the, um, the alternative history that her injury, uh, with her injury, with the um, blow to her head, 
uh, that she was able to divine things. Yes. Uh, so I highlight that. Uh, I highlight her faith, uh, which is rare in Maryland State Parks. They're all very secular. But when you talk about Harriet Tubman, you can't leave out her faith and her religion. So when she got that head injury uh, afterwards, she would have very vivid dreams. Um, she talks about one dream where it's in color and it's bright and beautiful and she's flying over fields and woods and the water and she's free. Uh, she would hear people singing and she would just suddenly start singing and clapping herself. Um, so that was her connection to the divine. She also said she felt um, a presence with her when she was traveling in the woods. Mm -hmm. um, and I usually don't bring up her religion unless it's someone asked me to. Like if Lisa had said, please bring up her religion too, I would have, but I usually don't unless it pops up in the question. So I'm glad you did. Um, but that was a key component. That was a big change in her life um, for her spirituality. She felt she had a direct connection to the voice of God after she received that head injury. Mm -hmm. uh, and you also have to keep in mind that um, enslaved people were sent to church, uh, mm -hmm. but they also were... I don't want to call it brainwashed. They were just given bad information. So they'd say, keep in mind, when you go to church and you hear that God is your master, I'm your master on earth. When you hear obey me, think of me, your master. Um, so they would be forced to go to these churches and hear horrific propaganda, but they also would not necessarily take that to heart. And so they had camp meetings where they would go into the woods and build fires and sing and talk and preach. And one of my favorite parts of camp meetings is that there were free African-American women, including Sojourner Truth, which is who is famous, uh, Jarena Lee and Selfa Elaw, and they would travel around, including the eastern shore of Maryland. They went to nearby Enel Springs, and I, I think that's near Bucktown, um, to preach. And since Black women were not thought terribly highly of, no one thought that they were doing anything. And so no mm -hmm. one stopped them because... If you're a black woman, you can't do anything that could halt or hurt a white man. So they were allowed to walk around and travel and preach more so than anybody else. And so I'm sure they were very inspiring to Harriet Tubman, as well as her maternal grandmother. Her name was Modesty, and she was straight from Africa. And Modesty was very spiritual. So if you combine Modesty's spirituality with Tubman's Christian religion, that's how you get um, her religious focus. Um, mm. And that's, that's fairly common if you read about um, um, religion to enslaved people. Uh, there's a gentleman, his last name is Robito, and he wrote a book about uh, enslaved people's religion. And I only got halfway through it because it was cutting me to the bone. It was just mm -hmm. so close. I was like, this, this, it's just a little too much. You know, I was like, mm -hmm. this describes my religious upbringing too and my religious experience. I will mm -hmm. finish it. I just couldn't at the time because it was just, it was so accurate. I felt seen a little bit too much, if that makes mm. sense. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, yeah Robito's book was great. Let me look up how to spell his last Robito. name. Robito. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Is that Robito? He's. I, I might be pronouncing it wrong, but he's. Uh, let me see. Let me just look up the book. Hold on. Sure. Again, I usually try not to be on my phone, but this is great for that. Let's see if I can find his name. Yep, Slave Religion by Albert J. R. A. B. O. T. E. A. U. Robito, Robito. Great. Uh, yep. And Thank you. Like I said, I only got halfway through that book because it was a little too close. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, how accurate is the movie Har Harriet from, <laughs> <laughs> from your uh, estimation? It's a great question. Uh, I think Kate was their consultant as well. Uh, the first thing I wanna highlight is that it was filmed in Virginia. Um, a lot of people notice the rolling hills. There are no rolling hills on the Eastern shore of Maryland. That scene where she jumps off the bridge into a rushing stream with white water, that doesn't exist on the Eastern shore of Maryland. You saw what it looked like in my photos. It is, mm -hmm. the water is flat it's and muddy. I've seen a few creeks that I would say were moving, but they were never rushing. Um, treacherous, yes, but never anything that was portrayed there. Um, they also got the, high, the timeline a little bit wrong. They compressed a lot of things, mm -hmm. which you have to do for time, I understand. Mm -hmm. um, and what else? I think they showed her escaping from Bucktown and she escaped from Poplar Neck, which they do mention. Um, there's a few characters that are conglomerations, like the gentleman, I, his name escapes me, but he's African-American and he was a slave catcher. 
he's a conglomerate of a number of different uh, mm -hmm. individuals that might not have necessarily acted on Harriet Tubman, but they were historically accurate. Um, I thought it was a good movie and it, it, anything that gets people interested in Tubman's story is worthwhile to me. Uh, what I did love was the music. Um, I've seen the movie probably five, six, seven times, some of them for work. Like I was invited to speak after the, meet, the uh -huh. movie to talk to people about it. And whenever the gentleman, the Reverend Sam Green is a real character and he's mm. played by um, Bondi Curtis Hall. And whenever he sings, I get church. And so the music, the music in that is the most amazing part to me. And she actually sings the goodbye song that Tubman sang. Um, I'm going to leave you. I'm sorry. I'm going to leave you. Farewell. Oh, farewell. But she actually sang that song. So to hear Cynthia Erivo sing it in character was very, very moving for me, too. Um, but I usually just point out the landscape is the biggest thing. The timeline is crunched. Uh, John Brown was never in Philadelphia. It shows him at the end in Philadelphia. He wasn't in Philadelphia with Harriet Tubman on a boat. Mm -hmm. um, but I, and they mentioned the Kumbi River raid, which I wish they would have highlighted more. It just shows her on a boat mm -hmm. and then it shows people running out of the fog. I kind of mentioned that. I, they could have spent half the movie, in my opinion, talking about the Kumbi River raid. And the William Still portion is accurate. Uh, it's, he's portrayed by um, Leslie Odom Jr. And I thought that was excellent. If you wanna read any direct runaway accounts, you can read William Still's book. It is Bible thick, it's 800 pages. It's called The Underground Railroad. I highly recommend it. And there's a few copies online if you can get the ones with uh, his letters in the beginning, those are the best because his writing is so moving to me. Um, and then he was risking his life doing everything he was doing, writing down those stories. Um, but I think the movie Harriet did a good job. Like I said, some things make me cringe because I talk about them every day. And but of course, it's it's not my movie. I think they did a fabulous job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, is her home in Auburn, New York, still standing? Yes. Yes, it's a national park. Um, it is in Auburn, New York. Uh, her home is standing. That one picture that you saw was her home in the way it looks mm -hmm. now. The original burned down, so she rebuilt it uh, with brick. Uh, there's also the home for the aged that you saw, that white building that's still there. Uh, it's all behind a gate and it's all closed now for obvious reasons, but uh, hopefully they'll reopen it soon. But yes, it is still up in Auburn, New York, and you can visit her grave. Those pictures I have of her grave are um, taken last year. I went to say goodbye and thank you, and I put all of our patches down at the bottom so you could see those on there as well. Mm -hmm. And like I said, she's buried next to her brother. What better place to be buried? Mm -hmm. she yeah. wanted that closeness with her family so. yeah yeah and she's yeah. under this giant tree which I thought was wonderful mm. yeah so Beautiful. if you go look for the giant tree and there's Harriet um okay so there's a couple of um questions about your life um history should you want to um answer I'm gonna combine them both so you can answer or not at will um okay. so uh Amanda is curious about um your journey to becoming a ranger if you would be um <laughs> willing to share that and then yeah. Kristen is um curious about who or what influenced your love of nature Mm, okay, I'll start with Amanda's. My journey to become a ranger was very, it was all over the place. I think a lot of my coworkers were born and they're like, I want to be a ranger. And they knew from the start. Uh, I was not one of those people. I was supposed to be an environmental lawyer. So I went to school for energy and environmental policy. That's what I got my master's in. And I started doing work for state implementation plans for the Clean Air Act. And I remember sitting at a meeting and they were like, okay, so this will start in 2023. And at the time it was 2010. And I remember mm -hmm. thinking, oh, okay. And the more I started working on these plans, like the Clean Air Act is great, but they were all so far out. And I wanted to do something now. Um, so the Maryland Department of Natural Resources, of course I was living in Maryland and still am, but they don't, I've only seen them hire for rangers once before I put in my application. So they, I saw that and I was like, oh, I missed it. And then they did a ranger school and I was like, oh my gosh, I wanna go so bad. And then they started uh, hiring again for rangers. So I said, oh, at least put in, what are they gonna say? No. So I put in for it and got one of the later calls in an interview and they were like, are you willing to move? I said, sure. So um, that's how I got up to Elk Neck in Cecil County. Um, which is a gorgeous park if you've never been. It has Turkey Point Lighthouse, which is the highest lighthouse in, on the Chesapeake Bay. Mm. And it's also the lighthouse that had the most uh, lady light managers. 
Uh, it had three total. One of them actually had to write her congressperson to keep her job after her husband died. So her oh, name wow. is Fannie Mae Salter, if you ever look up Fannie Mae. Um, so that was my roundabout ranger story. I think a lot of people, depending on your age, you can be in the Maryland Conservation Corps if you're under 25, I believe. I clearly missed that by a good few years. A lot of people do, um, they become seasonal rangers. So you're on a 10 month contract and you can work for the Maryland Park Service. And since each park is so different, whenever people say, I wanna be a ranger, I was like, go to a park and see if it's what you wanna do. And if the staff is uh, like your speed, cause I know gunpowder has 16,000 acres, an island, a rail trail, a battlefield, a full beach with 17 lifeguards, marinas, soft launches, it has a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. uh, Rocky Gap, my favorite, has a huge lake with the, I think one of the top three largest campgrounds in the state. Uh, Assateague has um, ponies and camping and it's on the sand. So find a location that you like uh, and something that you can be passionate about. Um, so I, I guess that's my roundabout story of becoming a ranger. Uh, and keep in mind, I think people think we hug Yogi Bear a lot. I also pick up a lot of trash and clean back. <laughs> A real talk. Park there. Yes, I'm going to be very honest. I tell people you can't park there. You can't put a fire there. And let me tell you why you can't put a fire right there. Um, so there's some, there's, I, I just like how broad it is. Each day is so, so very different. Um, but then they, they let you do, I don't know, amazing things like these presentations or helping to interpret, um, the difficult histories of other state parks, like I'm meeting Lieutenant Governor on Friday with Outdoor Afro, things like that are really, really fun. Um, and then there was a second question. Oh, my love of nature. Um, I think, well, my mother was a very outdoorsy kid. Uh, so she didn't really like us watching TV as much as we would. So she'd kick us out and we'd hang out at a local creek. Um, near my home, we'd like just walk down the hill and play at the creek. We'd see tadpoles, we'd run around in nature, spend the whole day there, build these little huts where we could hang out and then come home. And that was just our summer, that was our day. And uh, then I started going to summer camps, which had me outside a lot and working there. And I think I was a stable hand for a little while. I taught sailing for a little while, lived in a teepee. It was just a little bit of everything. And so that's kind of, it, it just feels natural, if that makes sense. That makes it a lot of there. sense. Harriet Tubman reaffirmed it, but it was it was always there. Like I said, I'm comfortable with bugs as long as it's not a tarantula in my locks. I can deal with those things <laughs> that would over the edge. So very good questions, and I hope I answered them. But yeah, becoming a ranger was very roundabout and also very late for me. Most people start in their 20s. I started in my 30s. So it just depends on where you are and what you hope to achieve. Great. So with that, I think we're going to wrap up. There's still quite a few questions, but I'm, we're going to let you uh, go back to your to your day. Uh, but I do just want to thank you so much. We've got lots and lots of people writing in to say thank you. Um, one person wrote that it was life changing this talk. Oh, stop. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's it. That's what we hope for. So I, I just am so thankful for you um, to talk to us so much, sharing so generously about your life um, and also about Tubman, who you're clearly passionate about and that we can all really take a, a, a piece page from her book if we were only so lucky. Yes, so. she was so strong and so loving and so caring. So thank you all. Yes, really, really appreciate you. Aww. And for those of you out there, we have a couple more um, talks that you might be interested in um, joining on Tuesday, May 4th at 11 a.m. Um, we have Judith Carney, um, professor of UCLA, speaking about Africa's food legacy in the Atlantic world. Um, and on May 18th, um, we have Yale professor uh, Carolyn Roberts um, speaking about um, medicine, knowledge, and power in the Atlantic slave trade. Um, so we have some great um, speakers coming up and we hope um, you'll join us. And um, Angela, thank you so very much. You're very welcome. It was my pleasure. Take care. Everyone. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you.